everybody. Good morning. Good morning from Berlin. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar, German Africa Foundation event with the title Human Rights, Transitional Justice and the Difficult Search for a Political Solution in Ethiopia. I have a conversation with Dr. Daniel Bekele, the Chief Commissioner of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and uh, winner of the German Africa Award 2021. My name is David Schwacker. I'm the Secretary General of the German Africa Foundation. I want to welcome our members, of course, and friends of the German Africa Foundation, everybody who takes an interest and cares about uh, Ethiopia, in particular, of course, uh, the members of parliament who are online with us this morning. This event will be held in English. We have um, uh, no translation this time. Let me tell you briefly a bit about the program. I will interview Dr. Daniel for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we have another 25 minutes for your questions. If you want to ask questions or make comments before, you have three options to do that. You can use the chat functions. I think most of you know the chat functions. There's also the Q&A function. So if you have direct questions that you want me to ask um, Dr. Daniel, you can use that functions. You can also wait for you know, the, the, the part of um, the function when we bring you in and then raise your hand and we will then give you the, the, the chance to be on the screen and to ask your question. Let me start by introducing Dr. Daniel uh, to you. Dr. Daniel uh, is currently the chief Commissioner of the Ethiopian Rights Commission. Uh, as I said earlier, he's honored by the German Africa Foundation with the German Africa Award for his lifelong fight for human rights. Daniel's commitment to human rights began very early at the age of 23. He started working as a lawyer in Addis Ababa. He worked uh, closely on a number of uh, rights, including women's rights, uh, closely working with the Ethiopian Women's Lawyers Association. In 2004, he became head of policy research and advocacy at Action Aid in Ethiopia and was one of the leading activists also on the global call to action against poverty. In uh, 2005, uh, he was among the leading figures monitoring the elections. And after criticizing the conduct uh, of the elections in 2005, he was attacked and injured by armed government security operatives in October of 2005. In November 2005, he was then arrested and subsequently sentenced to prison. And he remained um, in prison until March of 2008. Later on, between 2011 and 2019, he worked uh, for Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. He then came back to Ethiopia in 2019 to assume the, the position that he currently has, one of Ethiopian, uh, of, of Chief Commissioner of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. Welcome, Dr. Daniel. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you here. And thank you very much uh, for being available for my questions and for the questions that the, the audience will ask uh, later on. Uh, let's start with you know, a, a very general question uh, to understand where you are coming from. Many people care about human rights. You, however, as we saw in your CV, dedicated um, most of your life to the protection of human rights. What made you do so? Were there any particular triggers in the beginning that made you choose this path? Sure, thanks, David. Uh, and thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, good morning and hello to all uh, the participants and the attendees uh, for this call. Uh, in response to your question, I, 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 uh, I guess I can probably say uh, that uh, the fact that I grew up at a time when my country was under a military dictatorship uh, and uh, growing in an environment where I um, uh, have been exposed to lots of violations and abuses by the military dictatorship at the time, uh, including, you know, witnessing how uh, dissent and protest was brutally cracked down by, by police and neighborhood security operatives uh, uh, in my own neighborhood, around my school and around my family. And, you know, I, uh, you know for, for people who remember the time of Ethiopia's military dictatorship, it was uh, one of the most abusive uh, political roles in Ethiopia's history. 
And I suspect that the uh, environment uh, made me a socially aware person. Uh, it made me aware um, of the need for social justice and the importance of uh, rule of law. And I guess, you know, uh, that must have uh, contributed to uh, my, my, my interest and uh, my work over many years on human rights issues. Thank you, thank you, I understand. You spent, as we saw, some time abroad working for Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And these are, if I may say so, these are nice jobs or relatively nice jobs. Um, why did you then choose to come back to Ethiopia to take on the job uh, as Chief Commissioner of the Ethiopian Rights Commission? Sure, yeah. I mean, in uh, 2018, when uh, Ethiopia's new political chapter started with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed coming uh, into office. Uh, it was a start of a major new political chapter in Ethiopia, which inspired not only Ethiopians, but uh, I should say uh, global inspiration as well, with a new hope for uh, Ethiopia, which started off with uh, a major uh, shift from its political past with opening up of political space and uh, the reform and repeal of repressive laws and release of political prisoners and inviting all uh, opposition groups into the country and so on. You know, it was, it was a major uh, turning point in Ethiopia's recent political history. And it was in that context that I was also invited to come and uh, support in the new reform and restructuring initiative. And it was, uh, it was an exciting uh, opportunity, but it was also an honor. Uh, to be asked to come and serve uh, for your country. As, as you mentioned, I, I had some good jobs with uh, major international human rights institutions, uh, but uh, with, with the support of my family and my friends, I had to leave my job and I had to leave my family to come and assume this responsibility, but I accepted it with a huge sense of uh, uh, honor, pride and responsibility to participate in the reform uh, process of Ethiopia's new political chapter, uh, despite all of its challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you mentioned 28 and the, the big enthusiasm, I think that inspired millions of Ethiopians and, uh, and, and many, many people ab abroad had a lot of hope uh, for Ethiopia and for true change in Ethiopia. Things have turned out in a different way. And since uh, November of last year, a civil war between the Ethiopian government and the Tigrayan TPLF began that is still ongoing. How difficult has it been for you and the Ethiopian rights, Human Rights Commission to work in this, this new, very polarized environment? Uh, taking into consideration, of course, that after all, the, the commission is an Ethiopian state institution. Uh... I mean, being a state institution is not uh, a problem in and of itself, David, uh, because uh, national human rights institutions that exist across the uh, world in all countries, uh, including in your own country in Germany and you know, in, in all other countries, the national human rights institutions that are established for the purpose of promotion and protection of human rights are all state institutions. And, uh, and all countries actually need such a strong state institution that work independently from the influence of the executive branch of the government. Uh, so one, one of the problems in Ethiopia's political history has been the absence of uh, a strong, independent and effective institutions. And, and part of the reason why I, uh, I took this opportunity to lead the reform and the capacity building initiative at the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. So uh, being a state institution is not a problem in itself, and it is the right thing actually that uh, all countries build strong, independent, and effective institutions. Uh, but the political environment in which we undertook this um, investigation, both as the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, as well as jointly with the UN uh, Office uh, of Human Rights, uh, has been very challenging uh, on many levels. Uh, one of which included the, the extremely polarized uh, political environment in Ethiopia. Uh, I might probably also add that uh, quite, uh, quite a toxic and uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, a very unfriendly political uh, in, environment in Ethiopia, which has divided uh, people uh, very sadly along ethnic lines, uh, has, has made 
the work of an independent human rights uh, inquiry difficult, but there were also other challenges such as the security challenge, operational challenge, administrative challenge, the challenge of um, an emerging institution trying to build its capacity are, are, uh, are only some of the challenges. Thank you. You already mentioned the, the report, the joint report that uh, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and the um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights published on November 3rd, uh, a, a probe or a report about the human rights violations um, in the Tigray conflict from, I think, November of last year until June 30th, if I'm not um, uh, mistaken. Uh, so th this is a joint report. Um, and I know how difficult it sometimes is to, 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 to write a, a report jointly with another institution. So let me ask you, how difficult was it to agree on the same kind of language with, um, with the UN? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the fact that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission uh, has entered into this joint um, investigation uh, project with uh, UN Office of Human Rights uh, is in uh, many senses uh, unique uh, in, in its approach because there has not been a lot of precedent where the, the international uh, human rights body or mechanism has come in collaboration with national human rights institutions for such kind of investigation. There are uh, very few examples uh, out there, but not exactly at this level. There's, there's one experiment in, uh, in Afghanistan and there was one in Uganda, uh, but neither of them are uh, to this level. So this was probably the first of its kind in its nature that the UN office has agreed to uh, join in partnership with a local uh, human rights uh, mechanism and institution to, to undertake such a joint investigation. So, uh, you know, having two institutions with their own different systems and ways of working things and their own internal uh, review processes, uh, it is, uh, it might be a bit of a challenge uh, for two institutions to work in this uh, manner. But I didn't. I don't. I don't really think that um, agreeing on a language or our assessment was the biggest uh, challenge we faced. You know, we have not had a, a big problem in terms of uh, agreeing on a language or uh, on our assessment. You know, uh, because we have made sure that this investigation was guided by a mutually agreed methods of work, which we developed uh, before we got we got into the actual work. So much of the work was completed when. Uh, we agreed on the terms of reference as well as on the methods of work by which we guided uh, our, our joint inquiry. So it is a jointly gathered evidence. It's a jointly done assessment and uh, it is experts on human rights law from, from both institutions. So it was not so much of a, a problem to agree on, uh, on language and uh, assessment. You know, We had other challenges such as uh, are getting access to all the places we hoped to be able to mm -hmm. get to and security situation and operational and administrative challenge, but uh, agreeing on a language was not uh, the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Let me briefly follow up on that. Did you have joint teams or did you separate the country among you and the UN or how did it work? It was a joint team all along. Uh, we did not divide places or issues uh, uh, by, uh, with the two institutions. So how it really worked was uh, for every uh, piece of uh, uh, field visit or investigation that uh, we have uh, been able to cover, it would be an equal number of uh, human rights investigators and experts from both institutions going to the place and talking to victims and families and uh, local institutions and state officials from regional as well as federal level and hospital workers and uh, international NGO and local NGO workers, you know, talking to a wide range of sources mm -hmm. with uh, a joint team from both institutions and the experts who have conducted the investigation writing a joint memo of their interviews, taking a joint note, 
Uh, and then, you know, we also have experts on various areas like gender experts and security experts and women's rights experts, a number of other experts who supported the joint investigation work. But it is a joint team of experts from both mm. institutions who undertook the investigation work. Thank you. Very interesting. Please tell us a little bit about uh, the, the main findings. Who's responsible for the human rights abuses in the Tigray conflict so far? So this investigation, as you uh, indicated, David, on your opening remark, it covers the period from the start of the, the, the war uh, uh, in early November until the end of June, uh, end of June being taken as a cutoff date because that was a time when the federal government declared unilateral ceasefire and withdrew from the Tigray region. Uh, and because we have not had access to the Tigray region after that period, uh, we had no option but to consider that as a cutoff period. Uh, so the, the investigation basically covers this period from, from November last week, last year to the end of June. Uh, so it by no means uh, is comprehensive uh, because we have not been able to access all the places that we hoped uh, we would access in this investigation, but on the basis of uh, the jointly gathered information and the jointly uh, done analysis of the, the evidences and the information we have, uh, we make uh, a number of uh, findings and conclusions, which includes uh, that all parties in the conflict uh, are, credible are credibly implicated on a wide range of human rights violations and abuses, uh, some of which may amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, and these violations include uh, attack on civilians, the killings of civilians, extrajudicial killings, uh, forced displacement, um, destruction of property, looting, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, um, uh, um, mistreatment uh, or violations uh, against refugees uh, are, uh, are only some of them. Uh, so it's a wide range of human rights violations and abuses, uh, as I mentioned, some of which uh, amount to serious atrocity crimes. Uh, and we find that all parties to the conflict uh, are uh, implicated with uh, these serious violations and abuses. Mm, thank you. Uh, let me follow up on that and talk a little bit about the reaction to the report before and after the publication of the report. People from us, all sides actually have accused the commission of siding with the Ethiopian government. People are claiming that the commission is downplaying what government troops have committed in terms of human rights abuses. And that the fact that the commission is downplaying government abuses, that that adds to the conflict. What's, what's your answer to those critics? Uh, sure. Uh, David, I have to say that uh, since uh, this unfortunate uh, war has erupted uh, in early November, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has uh, issued about uh, 14 uh, statements, including three uh, major investigation reports on uh, Tigray. Uh, this is since uh, November of last year. Uh, and you must remember that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission was also the first uh, institution to report on the involvement of Eritrean forces in the Tigray conflict and uh, the abuses uh, associated with that. Uh, and in uh, uh, the, the reports and statements that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has issued, including our report on the massacre in Aksum, uh, our report uh, identifies uh, serious major uh, violations, uh, some of which may amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. And the recently completed joint investigation report uh, with the UN also confirms a wide range of serious uh, human rights violations and abuses by all parties to the conflict, which includes uh, the, the Ethiopian forces. Uh, so I can't understand what, uh, what it means uh, when people make a criticism that we are downplaying the violations by uh, the Ethiopian forces when we are actually investigating, documenting, and reporting some serious uh, violations and abuses, some of which may amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. That by no means uh, is downplaying. It is just uh, telling uh, the truth as we find it. But as an independent national human rights institution, we don't focus on violation of only one party to the conflict. We do 
uh, investigation uh, on violations and abuses by all parties to the conflict, which includes uh, the Ethiopian forces, the Eritrean forces, the Tigray um, forces, uh, along with their allied militia and uh, uh, allied militias on the part of the Ethiopian forces as well. So we investigate, document, and report on abuses by all parties to the conflict. And what I find is a situation where, you know, parties to the conflict and their supporters uh, seem to welcome it when we uh, report on violation uh, of the other side but they don't seem to like it when we report uh, their own violations. So we, we get to be uh, criticized or attacked by, by parties to the conflict or their supporters, uh, left and right, uh, uh, because of this uh, work we have to do of uh, investigating, documenting, and reporting on violations and abuses by all parties. Uh, but this perception of uh, bias uh, is not unique to the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. You know, in the work we have done with the UN uh, office, we have seen that there are some communities who had uh, bias against the UN, uh, and there are some uh, places where we have seen bias against the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. And unfortunately, the extremely polarized and divisive political uh, environment in Ethiopia and much of the campaign on the social media must have contributed to that perception uh, of bias. And uh, that, was, that was a challenge that we had to work through. Uh, but it did not stop us from uh, conducting an independent investigation. Thank you. Let, let's talk a little bit about the current situation in Ethiopia, which of course is still very worrisome. Dominic Johnson, a leading German journalist in Africa with a TAT newspaper, published a piece a few days ago in which he compared the situation in Rwanda in 1994 to the current situation in Ethiopia. And we are indeed hearing information about the Ethiopian government calling on landlords in Addis Ababa to indicate where in the cities Tigrayans are residing. This, this sounds very much as the preparation for you know, them arresting them um, um, and, and, and so on. So my question is, is there an imminent danger of genocides in Ethiopia in your view and, and what can be done, what needs to be done to avert it? Um, I think one, one of the points you uh, mentioned, uh, David, that uh, government has called landlords to indicate where in Addis Ababa are residing is, uh, is inaccurate, David. I have not heard of that. I am aware that the, since the state of emergency was declared, the Ethiopian government has uh, given an instruction for landlords to register who the tenants uh, are, uh, which is not necessarily actually a new thing because uh, all landlords register their tenants uh, for tax purposes as well. Uh, but the, the point that uh, people have been asked to indicate where uh, the grants live uh, is inaccurate, which I uh, should correct. Um, Dominic Johnson is probably not the only person who has made a comparison with Rwanda, and it's an understandable concern when a conflict in a country uh, seems to deepen along ethnic lines. It is right to be concerned about the risk of atrocity crimes, and it is right that we pay uh, full attention to the dynamics of uh, this conflict uh, to prevent um, further atrocities than uh, we have seen. Uh, in the investigation that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has done so far, uh, and the joint investigation with the UN Human Rights Office, the types of crimes we have identified are uh, characterized as uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, whether or not there is a, a risk of genocide and whether the comparison with Rwanda is, uh, is accurate could be could be debatable, you know. Um, people can look at uh, different country situations in different lenses and, uh, you know, um, uh, different people might have different perspective. But in my view, uh, I don't necessarily consider it wrong to be worried and to be concerned about the risk of atrocity crimes in Ethiopia. Uh, because the, the extent and the amount of atrocity crimes we have seen over the last uh, couple of years is serious enough to warrant uh, uh, to warrant to be concerned, 
about more atrocity crimes and the need uh, to do something about it to prevent uh, further atrocity crimes. Thank you. I, I am not able now to check on you know whether or not or what 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 um, kind of uh, government order I was referring to, but. I think we both agree that get, that the, the the country is under a state of emergency right now, and that it has been. We have seen imprisonments follow um, after the um, the uh, the state of emergency has been declared uh, of Tigrayans in others. How concerned are you? And has the Human Rights Commission done anything about this? Uh, I am concerned with a new uh, uh, wave of arrests in uh, in Addis, and uh, it's not only in Addis. Actually, we are monitoring uh, arrests in connection with the state of emergency uh, in many places, including Addis. Uh, the state of emergency uh, gives uh, a degree of authority for Ethiopia's law enforcement. Uh, agencies and authorities to arrest and detain people on what the state of emergency described as a reasonable ground of suspicion. And we are concerned from the Human Rights Commission perspective on uh, you know, how this concept of reasonable ground of suspicion and uh, power given to the law enforcement agencies is used and applied uh, because uh, you know, generally any state of emergency situation uh, raises concern about human rights because some basic human rights would be suspended at the time of a uh, state of emergency and more power would be vested with um, security uh, officers, which uh, definitely raises concern about the state of human rights uh, situation in a country, which is why the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission is, the commission is really uh, mobilized to monitor the situation since the state of emergency was uh, declared. And uh, we have been concerned about uh, this new wave of arrests, uh, which has now uh, reached uh, thousands. And uh, we are concerned about uh, a possible uh, abuse of the state of emergency in a way that uh, affects uh, a lot of innocent uh, citizens and people. So uh, we continue to be concerned. We continue to monitor. Uh, both the circumstances under which people are uh, detained and making sure uh, that people should not be detained on the basis of uh, ethnic identity uh, and also monitoring their, uh, uh, their prison conditions. So we are concerned that uh, this wave of arrest uh, has also included uh, older persons, uh, people who are above uh, 60 years old. Uh, we're concerned that uh, people who need uh, regular medical access have also been included in this arrest. We do understand that the government uh, uh, defends uh, its security operation by arguing that uh, this is not ethnically targeted and this is in response to the uh, national security situation of the country and so on, which, uh, which we understand uh, where it is coming from. But, but at the same time, we remain concerned on how the state of emergency is being applied and, and the risk of abuse and, uh, and, and, and innocent uh, civilians uh, and people uh, who lived uh, in the cities being affected with the way the state of emergency is being implemented. Thank you. Let's, um, let's talk a bit, little, little bit about the way forward. What, what needs to happen to end the war? And what are the chances that the parties to the conflict will accept a peaceful solution, given the current rhetoric, given also that Ethiopia has no tradition of peaceful accommodation? Um, David, I have to say that uh, my country has a long history of uh, conflict and war, but uh, it also has a long history and tradition of uh, peaceful accommodation and coexistence because it's a country that has uh, existed for many, many years uh, and thousands of years actually uh, as a multi-ethnic country. Uh, we are definitely a diverse country with uh, diverse ethnic groups and uh, diverse language and uh, colorful diversity. And Ethiopia has been through a lot of uh, difficult times and difficult challenges uh, over the last so many years. 
uh, but somehow Ethiopia has uh, managed to overcome a lot of this challenge and uh, relied on its traditional systems and institutions as well for uh, uh, peaceful accommodation. Uh, but that does not, of course, deny the fact that uh, it has also been a history uh, of many, many wars and lots of senseless cases and destruction and displacement. So despite uh, this depressing story of um, war, conflict, death, destruction, and so on, I remain hopeful that uh, Ethiopians, uh, together with uh, Ethiopia's friends, uh, would be able to find a way out of this cycle of violence. And it does seem to me that what needs to happen at this moment is for all parties in the conflict uh, to pause uh, and acknowledge responsibility for what has happened so far. Uh, all parties to the conflict uh, have to acknowledge responsibility for all the violations and abuses that have happened uh, and use the opportunity of the joint investigation report that we did with the UN Human Rights Office uh, as an opportunity to start a new chapter. And that starts by acknowledging responsibility. Uh, instead of uh, pointing figure against each other, I think all parties to the conflict should uh, take a moment to pause, to acknowledge responsibility, and to agree on a new way forward, which includes uh, cessation of hostilities and agreeing to resolve uh, uh, all the uh, problems and differences in, in a peaceful way for what is essentially a political problem. Thank you. Let, let me follow up on that. Um, I mean, we have been talking about atrocities now and about the ethnic differences, um, which has, have, I think, grown over the past 30 years. Um, my question is, what, what are the chances, or, or let's say, what, what are the, the, the the foundations of a future Ethiopia, is there still enough common ground among the different peoples of Ethiopia to, to agree on a common way forward? Is, is there something like a, a common vision of the country that all Ethiopians eventually will be able to agree upon? Um. Yes, David. I mean, I think it's uh, it's both interesting and uh, a useful question uh, that uh, uh, both Ethiopians and friends of Ethiopia should be asking and searching for uh, what that common uh, ground is for a future vision of Ethiopia. Uh, I mean, I, I would say, you know, it has uh, um, been uh, such a brutal uh, conflict and uh, lots of violations and abuses, which has undoubtedly damaged uh, social fabrics in a community as well. And it will uh, definitely take some time to heal uh, the wounds. It will definitely take some time to uh, build confidence and trust among communities. Uh, and sadly, uh, the, the type of political rule that Ethiopia has been through over the last uh, three decades, uh, uh, has contributed to a degree of uh, uh, division and tension along ethnic lines in, uh, in Ethiopia. You know, the, the, the type of political system we experimented with, uh, which was meant to address uh, a history of uh, uh, inequality among the Ethiopian uh, ethnic groups, uh, has uh, unfortunately ended up in exacerbating the problem than, than resolving it. So. Ethiopians have, uh, have a huge task to confront uh, what has worked and what has not worked and to agree on, on a way forward uh, with an honest uh, conversation, with an honest dialogue uh, of uh, what the problem has been in the past and what has worked, what has not worked, as I mentioned. Uh, and I do uh, believe that uh, uh, the sense of uh, Ethiopians feeling as a country, as one Ethiopia, uh, based on its diversity, as well as Ethiopia's long history, uh, Ethiopia's long history of civilization, Ethiopia's long history of uh, coexistence of uh, different religious groups and ethnic groups, uh, and Ethiopians' desire uh, for uh, Ethiopia to continue as a country would hopefully be a foundation for Ethiopians to come together and uh, chart their future. I know uh, it is not going to be easy, but uh, you know, I think 
Ethiopians, along with uh, their, uh, their our, our partners and friends, uh, have a responsibility to, uh, to tackle this head on. I think what we need to understand is uh, uh, war should not be uh, the way to resolve uh, differences. And it is really a moment uh, to, to pause and think that uh, uh, lots of suffering uh, have already uh, um, you know, affected uh, millions of people. And it is a moment to take responsibility to, uh, to come together around the table uh, to think about the way forward, David. Thank you. Let me follow up on that, but also go back then to you know, the beginning when we talked about 2018 and the great hopes that Ethiopians and I think millions around the world had when they saw you know, young people taking to the street. How, how much is left of this movement? How much is left um, of 2018 and can you know, the, the enthusiasm about the opening of 2018 still be part of the solution now? And, and maybe as a separate question, what role can the prime minister still play in, in, in the future of the country in your view? Sure, I mean, you know, the, the, the excitement, the demonstration and people uh, taking it to the street in 2018 and just ahead of uh, the new political chapter in Ethiopia, uh, um, and that big sense of uh, hope and inspiration has uh, certainly uh, suffered a degree of uh, challenge over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, uh, but despite this uh, challenge, uh, I remain hopeful that, uh, you know, the majority of Ethiopians still uh, are very passionate about the peace and development and future of their country. The majority of Ethiopians uh, who have, um, you know, intermarried and intermingled and who have moved from one part of the country to another part of the country, who have uh, settled and uh, lived life in, uh, in a place uh, different from where uh, their families come from, uh, is really a strong foundation for uh, Ethiopians to uh, uh, envision a future of uh, uh, peaceful uh, coexistence uh, and even more uh, peaceful friendship as well. But it is, I think, important to at least start with uh, uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a foundation for more than peaceful coexistence and uh, friendly uh, relationship based on trust and confidence as well. So despite the uh, challenges of the last couple of years, I. I, I remain hopeful there is, there is chance and opportunity to start a new chapter. Uh, and I am also hopeful that uh, the prime minister who has uh, recently been uh, elected, uh, popularly elected, I have to say, you know, it was uh, a difficult election on uh, many levels, but compared to elections that Ethiopia have had in the past, uh, it was a reasonably uh, good election in which the majority of Ethiopians have participated. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia has an elected government now, and it's very important that uh, this newly elected government and uh, the prime minister also have uh, uh, a big responsibility of uh, bringing together the country uh, in a new uh, way forward. Thank you very much. Let me bring in the audience now. We have a couple of uh, questions in uh, the Q&A function. Some of them uh, focus on the role of the international community or the donor community. Uh, what, what is the role foreign donors or the international community at large can play now in your view? Uh, I think we have the, the AU, uh, the Americans, the EU, of course, and then there's also Germany. Uh, do you see a special role for Germany? And, and what's your view on, um, on what the international community can, can add in, in terms of getting closer uh, to a peaceful solution. Sure, I mean, I, I think I would begin by saying, just uh, following up on what I uh, just said, I think uh, it is still the people of Ethiopia who have uh, really the highest uh, stake in putting an end to the suffering of their fellow Ethiopians. Uh, it, is, it is really a principle that defines sovereignty, uh, but it's also a human standard. Uh, to live up to, and I really hope that uh, Ethiopians first and foremost uh, take uh, responsibility to bring an end to this uh, suffering. Uh, but that does not in any way exclude uh, the need uh, and the support of Ethiopia's friends. 
uh, Ethiopia's friends uh, internationally, as well as uh, in our own uh, region and the continent, uh, should come to support Ethiopians uh, in this difficult moment. Uh, as independent uh, interlocutors, as independent facilitators, as uh, independent uh, advisors uh, to, to support Ethiopians on, uh, uh, on this political divide, uh, encouraging Ethiopia on, uh, on the right direction uh, to uh, this uh, peace and development uh, for the future, um, as well as uh, responding to uh, the massive humanitarian uh, crisis as well. Uh, you know, this, this war has uh, devastated uh, lots of families and lots of communities uh, whose livelihood has been shattered. Uh, people have uh, not only lost their loved ones, but people have also lost their livelihood and they want their life back. Uh, that's one of the things that we have picked up in the joint investigation that people want their life back. Uh, and Ethiopia really needs uh, the assistance of uh, its friends in uh, restoring uh, not only uh, peace and stability, but rehabilitation of communities. Uh, and uh, to be part of the search for a long-term sustainable solution as well. So there's a lot of uh, room and opportunity for Ethiopia's uh, friends uh, to uh, stand with Ethiopia and Ethiopians uh, of all uh, divide of this political spectrum uh, in the search for uh, peace as well as uh, the support for um, affected communities uh, as well. Thank you. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to include you now. If you want to be on the screen, please raise your hand. Um, we are waiting for your interventions if you want to intervene. As long as we uh, wait, I would um, read out one question, uh, even though it's relatively long, but I think it's worth uh, taking a closer look at it. I, I read it to you, Daniel. Dears, thanks for this chance. Um, if the Axel massacre were reported by Dr. Daniel, why is that removed by the joint UN investigation team? Or then, UN investigation then? And why is the need to cut the investigation in June? I myself was in Sudan and made a video from innocent Makata Tigrayans who need justice. It is not about Tigrayan or non Tigrayan. The investigation shouldn't level those victims and perpetrators equally. That is why the Ethiopian government has accepted. The genocide on Tigrayans has started with words, Dr. Daniel was trying to hide the atrocities of the government. Tomorrow, there will be one independent investigation for sure. Think about it, justice must be done. Um, Any comment, Daniel? Uh, lots of pointers there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I did not catch the name of the person who posed those uh, questions, but I would say, uh, we needed to take June as a cutoff period, as I uh, already mentioned earlier, because uh, uh, the investigation needed to be completed uh, for a timely release. And uh, uh, because we were not able to access uh, Tigray region after end of June, after the federal government withdrew, we thought it would make sense uh, to have a cutoff period and share to Ethiopia and the world what we have found so far, uh, while we agreed to continue to, uh, to monitor and investigate the situation beyond June as well. Uh, and uh, June as a cutoff period does not mean that we are not uh, monitoring what has happened uh, since June. Uh, indeed, actually, both the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and the UN have continued to monitor and investigate the situation after the end of June. Uh, and we're already uh, having conversation about the possibility of a joint report on incidents after June as well. Or at least both institutions would have their own separate report and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has actually issued uh, one brief report uh, of uh, the human rights situation after the end of June, at least as it relates to certain parts of the Amara region. Um, did we do anything to hide atrocities? Uh, I'm afraid not. You know, actually, the like I mentioned, you know, the the public reports and statements and my own engagement with media and interlocutors is a testament to the fact that what we have actually been doing was uncovering atrocities. You know, so we have documented and reported on atrocities uh, everywhere we found them by by all parties to the conflict. 
have we been able to speak to all victims and their families? And have we been able to reach to all the places that we would have loved to? Absolutely not. You know, the, there is no question about that. When we started this joint investigation, we hoped we would cover all the grounds and we hoped we would do a comprehensive report. Uh, but the situation did not allow us to do a comprehensive report, but we believe that what we have documented and reported fairly illustrates the general patterns of the human rights situation in Sudan. But this report is not necessarily the end of uh, all investigations. I, I hope uh, we will continue uh, to try and access all places of atrocity crimes, and we will continue to investigate, document, and report because the truth has to be told because justice has to be done because uh, victims and families need to uh, be redressed. So we will continue with all of that. Uh, were there any other, uh, it was a lot of points on that question. So I'm not sure if I have addressed all the questions, but uh, remind me, David, if I have forgotten anything. Do, do you want to comment in particular on my cadre? Uh, so, well, my cadre was one of the atrocity crimes uh, that happened in the context of uh, this conflict, but it is uh, by no means the only one. Uh, my cadre, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has, uh, has reported on the, the atrocity crime in my cadre before the joint investigation, uh, actually. And it was a preliminary report that the commission did at the time, and we were very clear in our preliminary report that this is a preliminary report and we have not had a chance to speak with uh, ethnic Tigrayans who have been displaced from the area, from West Tigray at the time. And we, uh, we, we said that uh, we would cover that in the fuller report. Uh, but before we worked on the fuller report, the joint investigation has started. So we decided that the fuller report would be uh, taken care of by the joint investigation report. And the joint investigation report uh, has actually confirmed what the commission has already reported before that the uh, Maikadra massacre has happened. Uh, and it also led to uh, another uh, represal uh, attack uh, that has targeted ethnic Tigrayans, uh, was for uh, unlawful killings as well as forced displacement from the area. Uh, so, so, so what some of my brothers have been saying that my cadre did not happen is not true. My cadre has happened the same way as the Aksum massacre has happened. You know, there are some people who deny Aksum. There are some people who deny uh, my cadre and other atrocities as well. Uh, but uh, bottom line is my cadre is a real massacre that has happened. Aksum is a real massacre that has happened. Uh, and these are only some of the atrocities we have documented. Lots of terrible things have happened in this war. And the joint report is probably the, the, the first faithful account of what has happened in Tigray in this unfortunate uh, war, David. Thank you. I, I, I welcome Robert Smith now on the screen. Uh, thanks for participating and please ask your question. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for the discussion. Um, too much to be asked and too much to be commented. Um, I understand uh, the uh, spirit of the discussion and I appreciate that. Um, you have said and you have appealed that the Friends of Ethiopia should come forward and support Ethiopia in this time. Uh, I have observed, uh, I've been observing constantly during the last 12 months that friends of Ethiopia who have uh, very deep connections in different regions have been heavily attacked. Uh, it's not only about um, Ethiopians attacking Ethiopians, it's very much about different groups from government level uh, to the, let's say, social media level and um, different professional groups who use all their leverage to intimidate um, groups who are not only Ethiopians, but people linked with Ethiopian, Ethiopia, institutions, um, individuals, and so on. So supporting Ethiopia normally doesn't mean supporting the rhetorics, and in, in this case, very much the rhetorics of war. We have to be, I think, very clear that we have um, participants of the conflict in power positions. This is not about individual groups moving against each other, and we, we can have a neutral uh, stand if we are working with the government. Uh, the government itself is a party of conflict. So if you want to support Ethiopia, which always means supporting Ethiopians 
and supporting them in their quest for peace and solutions, it always includes heavy, heavy criticism, um, polite criticism, certainly, but heavy criticism um, towards actors of the conflict. And here's the problem. Um, I do not deny at all that the Human Rights Commission and members of the Human Rights Commission have tried very often their best to uh, document specific atrocities, but I absolutely am concerned about the selective approach. Um, I've been reading your reports. I've also been reading reports from 2018 and before, and I found a pattern. Um, you, you rightly said that there is, um, it cannot be comprehensive. Yes, I understand that. And uh, it would be foolish to demand a full picture within a short time, but there's a meta level. Let me focus on that. And then I will finish with my question because I needed to explain my question. Um, there's this meta level. One is reporting what is accessible, what is known, and then the question is what is made out of the reporting. My Dara, you have mentioned it, is, is, a, is the key example. Uh, as you know, the My Kadra report had been used immediately by government actors um, to uh, justify uh, uh, war emotions. And as we have seen with specific actors in the social sphere, uh, even genocidal speeches. Um, uh, this was regularly um, uh, regularly enforced, uh, strengthened with the references to the Maikadra report. So um, if you want to, to, to play a key role in, in the discussion, how to improve the human rights situation, I think it's absolutely necessary that you also address this meta level of abuse of your own reports and also uh, address the level, the problem how it can happen. It's not only because you do an independent research and someone uh, will abuse it. No, you have a leverage, you have a possibility to respond. And in the case of the Maikadara report, we have observed that um, your uh, commission moved in, of course, evidently with uh, government support, uh, which by itself constitutes the problem because the victims, many of them were displaced uh, or were extremely afraid to, to get, get into contact with anyone linked with the government, which is extremely understandable. It's part of the methodological challenge. But then if you publish your report with some authority, it creates false, uh, false evidence. Not because, I don't say that, you wanted to create it, but by default, it's a question of methodology. So it will be mis misused and that's uh, unavoidable if you accept such kind of conditions. And there's a problem. And I feel uh, at, to some degree, uh, your work has been instrumentalized uh, for the war. And that's a problem which is really important to be discussed. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Robert Smith. I think we, we understand the question. Uh, and, and the issue at hand, so, Daniel, what's your response? Response, sorry. Uh, sure, thanks, uh, uh, Wolpert, uh, for uh, those uh, comments and questions. And uh, let me say a couple of things. One, uh, you know, in any human rights investigation and reporting, there's always a risk that uh, parties to a conflict or their supporters uh, might want to use uh, a human rights investigation report to advance uh, a political agenda. Uh, my cadre and the Ethiopian conflict is not unique in this uh, sense, you know. Uh, when you have parties uh, who are actively engaged in ongoing uh, conflict uh, uh, and on ongoing uh, hostilities, um, it's not surprising that all sides to the conflict will uh, cherry pick uh, and use any media reports, any speech by any government official or uh, international personality or whatever, you know, to, to advance their cause. Uh, so it's not a huge surprise <laughs> that, uh, you know, parties to a conflict uh, use any publicly available information to advance a particular kind of narrative or a particular kind of cause. 
Would that be an excuse or a reason for human rights workers uh, to stop their work? Uh, definitely not. You know, would you stop on investigating and reporting on any conflict situation or a war situation or on a human rights situation just because it has a risk of being abused by one or the other party? Definitely not, you know. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a reality that we uh, we continue to deal with uh, not just in ethiopia but in any conflict situation across the globe uh, i've worked on a lot of conflict situation across africa and we have always had this problem in, in a lot of several conflicts in, in africa um your point about uh, you know friends of Ethiopia being attacked and intimidated and so on, I, I totally hear you. It is a very unfortunate uh, manifestation of uh, uh, what I described as uh, an extremely polarized uh, political environment uh, and often very toxic. And it really breaks my heart to see my brothers and sisters uh, so much divided along ethnic lines uh, and so much rhetoric and so much intimidation and so much hatred against one another, uh, which has also reached or uh, affected uh, friends of Ethiopia as well. And if you are not uh, supporting a particular uh, narrative uh, that uh, one or the other side subscribes to, you become an enemy, you get to be attacked, you get to be intimidated, you get to be on the subject of a smear campaign. And I, I experience this on my daily life and I see it in, it, it is so toxic and it really um, uh, breaks my heart. You know, it is, it is, it is my own friends, it is on my families, you know, uh, that uh, I know have uh, lived happily and intermarried are, um, you know, their, their social fabrics are being uh, torn apart with this uh, sad war. So it is a difficult time in Ethiopia's history. It just requires an understanding of Ethiopia's friends uh, to try and stay uh, above this uh, ethnic division and to try and bring together brothers and sisters in the spirit of understanding and support uh, each other. Uh, and I, I agree with you that, you know, uh, what I'm really talking about is support for Ethiopia and Ethiopians, you know. Uh, it, this, this conflict is uh, among Ethiopians, you know, so uh, in that sense, you know, uh, the, the polite but heavy criticism is absolutely welcome, you know, that is what we did with our joint investigation report. We did not mince our words when we uh, reported on violations and abuses by all parties to the conflict, including the Ethiopian forces. So, so I... Um, don't think, uh, Walbert, uh, we have uh, had any policy of selective approach on our um, investigation and reporting. If anything, I can tell you that uh, by my brothers and sisters in other parts of Ethiopia, we are accused of uh, overly focusing on Tigray while ignoring uh, uh, abuses and violations and atrocity crimes in other parts of Ethiopia, whether it is in Oromia or Southern Ethiopia or Afar and Somali region and Gambela and so on, you know. So if you're really sitting in my position, much of the complaint, the complaint I'm also hearing is, uh, you know, people tell me like how many outputs you have had on Tigray, but uh, not on Somali region on the conflict between Afar and Somali situation, you know, which has affected lots of people, you know. I can go on and go on to tell you that, uh, you know, unfortunately my country is in the middle of violent conflicts and there is no region that is not affected by such violent conflict. And uh, it is such a, a young institution desperately trying to respond to a lot of emergency situations across the country. And we do our best, but, but unfortunately we continue to be uh, attacked left and right uh, because people tend to look at our work in, an, in an ethnic lens and criticize us for some things which we have no control on, such as how your report is used by parties to the conflict. You know, When there is a clear distortion of our findings and recommendations, we go out to correct uh, misrepresentation. But do we have uh, control in uh, uh, 
uh, role in controlling the war narrative. Uh, that's I don't I don't consider that as our role. We we don't get into the war narrative of the parties. We we focus on our human rights work, and we report on human rights violations by uh, whoever uh, does the violation. So that is uh, where we uh, come uh, into the picture in this conflict as independent institution doing our best, but I uh, really genuinely welcome any feedback and criticism in our work. Uh, I don't consider our work is beyond criticism. I don't consider our work is comprehensive enough. So I welcome any feedback and criticism and my colleagues do the same. And it would be useful to help us to continue to improve our investigation documentation and report. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, answer to a very comprehensive question. We are almost out of time. Um, I, I would like to ask you to, to put forward two more questions that I see in the chat. Um, and I would ask you to, to give brief answers if, if, if you can. One is really straightforward. Does Daniel believe ethnic cleansing of Tigrayans happened in Western Tigray? The other one being, how do you see the demonizing language Abi uses against Tigrinya people, such as hyenas, cancer, and so on? So two very different questions, but two straightforward ones, I would say. Sure, uh, quickly, uh, David. Uh, the Joint Investigation Report has uh, clearly investigated and documented uh, forced displacement of uh, people. Uh, one as a result of the war and second forced displacement and one of these is particularly in West Tigray and lots of ethnic Tigrayans have forcibly been uh, displaced um, from West Tigray. This is clearly very well documented and reported in the joint investigation report. Uh, we have uh, documented and reported on uh, forced displacement, not only in Western Tigray, but uh, in other places as well, actually. The joint investigation report has not used the phrase uh, ethnic cleansing, which I am aware some politicians have used, uh, but I have to point out to um, the, the, the attendees, a questionnaire that uh, this, this concept of ethnic cleansing is not something which exists in the international human rights framework, although it is a concept that has evolved in the context of uh, uh, a conflict situation and has uh, increasingly been uh, referred to in judicial tribunals and has been used in UN instruments as well, but it is uh, it's a concept which uh, does not exactly exist in the international human rights framework that we use to guide such investigation, which is why the UN uh, and the European Human Rights Commission joint investigation has not used that language. But uh, we have definitely reported on forced displacement of people uh, in, uh, in places, including West Cry. Uh, dehumanizing language, uh, you know, we have also clearly spoken about this uh, as the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. We have seen uh, tendencies of uh, hate speech and misinformation and uh, disinformation, uh, particularly with uh, the, the rising uh, use of social media in Ethiopia. We uh, are concerned about the level of uh, hate speech, incitement and dehumanizing speech. I have to say from uh, all parties in the conflict. Uh, people uh, from both sides of the conflict have used uh, dehumanizing words uh, against uh, each other, which is uh, not acceptable. Uh, we condemn it in the strongest term and we have urged and called uh, all Ethiopians uh, and particularly people who are on media uh, use and social media and political leaders and everyone uh, who cared about Ethiopia to restrain uh, themselves from insightful remarks, from dehumanizing terms and words uh, which should be condemned in the strongest terms. Thank you very much. Uh, it is 12.35, we are at the end uh, of our program. I think we covered a lot of ground. I know that there are still many questions and comments out there and that, that not everybody is, is uh, happy and, and does agree with 
you know, what has been explained and put forward by Dr. Daniel. Um, I still want to thank everybody for being part of this conversation. I think it was uh, a civil conversation um, in, in the end, and it was a very interesting and I think uh, timely one. So thanks for being part of this um, program, Human Rights and Additional Justice in a Difficult Search for a Political Solution in Ethiopia. Uh, I think we all hope for a political solution. We wish you, uh, Daniel, all the best for the work of your commission. And, and we hope, obviously, that the commission and its work, the joint report and the reports that you will issue in the future may be part, maybe the beginning of what eventually then can be a political solution for Ethiopia, a country I think that many of us, all of us, I guess, care a lot about. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the audience for being with us.